So welcome back to another Explain Yourself episode. I'm still at the Ecological Society of America conference. I managed to get a bunch of these in while I was here. So we're with Kellen lacour Conant from Nichols State University. She's a master's student. So thank you so much for being with us and agreeing to talk about yourself and explain yourself to us. Uh, yeah, so my first, yeah, thanks. Um, my first question is, could you give us like the elevator pitch for your current research? My current research, I am studying a wetland native species called Lycium carolinianum. Easier name, wolfberry or Christmas berry. Um, it's a native cousin of goji berry. Oh. So why I'm focusing on this species is because it's very important or valuable to coastal wildlife like whooping cranes, pelicans, um, deer, pollinator. They use it for food and for nesting habitat. Um, and it also has a lot of potential for use in vegetation planting. Um, I'm local to Louisiana, and we're dealing with the wetland loss, coastal land loss crisis. So this is a species that would really give us a lot of bang for our buck. It has a lot of diverse value and utility, both in the wetlands and possibly to humans as well. So just trying to get in there and learn as much as we can about this species locally. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And you said it's related to goji berries, so is uh, are the fruits of wolfberry or Christmas berry also like superfoods or whatever? Well, we haven't studied <laughs> this particular species yet, but a lot of research in Asia, um, like China and other areas who have studied their local lyceum species, they have, ha they have found that there's a lot of medicinal benefit to this species. It's been used for many centuries in traditional Chinese medicine, and they found that they're rich in antioxidants, um, vitamins, and things like that. So who knows, maybe we'll get there with this species. Interesting. Okay, so that was the elevator pitch version. Um, so now can you sort of more broadly, but also more detailed, give us like what specifically you are doing your master's research Yeah, of course. On. I have to put my water down because I fine. talk with my hands. So. <laughs> Um, specifically, I'm going to different sites in coastal Louisiana where there are isolated populations of wolfberry. And what I'm doing is I'm taking cuttings of the plants that I find there and I'm growing them in the greenhouse under different treatments to try and establish, well, if we want to grow this plant in a nursery setting or agriculturally, what irrigation works best? Um, do we need to apply hormone treatments? Should we get hardwood or softwood cuttings? Like, how can we grow this best? And also, do we see differences in growth rates and survivability across sites? Like, are some sites just better performing than others? So there's that. I'm also looking into how the species reproduces. Um, are certain communities, can they fertilize themselves and self-pollinate? Or do they need to have more allelic diversity? Um, and I'm also looking at seed and berry morphology to see do plants from different sites produce bigger fruit or higher quality seed? So that, like I said, if we're using it, especially for wetland restoration or for agriculture, we can isolate where the best quality seeds are and the best quality plants so that we can put those out mm -hmm. um, and they'll survive hopefully more. <laughs> okay, uh, so it sounds like you're looking at a lot of like inter interspecific variation, or sorry, intraspecific variation, right? In a, within like, a yeah, within a common garden type right, experiment? Right, it's a bit of okay. a common garden experiment. Um, and so far, I have seen some differences between the sites, mm. um, and some differences both in how they survive in the greenhouse, and morphological traits as far as their seeds and, and their berries, so. That's interesting. Cool, yeah. Um, and you said that you're taking cuttings, so this is a plant that's able to be growing from like a stem cutting or from a seed from the fruit? Right, okay. so if you take you know, an adult plant and you take a stem cutting, we call that vegetative propagation because you're essentially growing a clone of that species. Yeah. Um, so one benefit to that is that you're able to produce a large nursery stock in a shorter amount of time. But that's why it's so important that we have the genetic information about mm. how these species um, reproduces so that if you're putting clones out there, you can at least know, well, this is from this genetic stock. If we match it with this genetic stock, they should be able to reproduce. So 
Yeah, and also because we wouldn't want to fill an entire like restored or supplemented patch with identical clones and then have some pest or disease come through that they all happen to be susceptible to, right? Right, so <laughs> it's trying to find that balance between growing enough plants so that we can meet the demand for our restoration plantings and being aware of that need to maintain genetic diversity. Yeah, awesome. Um, and how are the seeds dispersed in this particular plant? Primarily by uh, the animals that eat them, eat okay. the berries. Um, so one of my research sites is Queen Bess Island, which is just a giant bird's nest almost, because <laughs> it's one of the, um, not dispatchment, but one of the sites where they reintroduced pelicans when we were mm. losing brown pelican populations in the 60s and 70s, and that was one of the more successful rookery sites. So now if you go out to Queen Bess Island, it's almost like a giant matted nest of this species, wolfberry, because the birds just nest in it. Um, they use it for their winter forage. Mm. It provides, for whooping cranes, it can provide up to half of their winter forage just on this species alone. Wow. So with all those birds flying around and eating the berries, that's kind of like a natural pollinator and, and seed disperser. That's amazing. Okay. And so is that... Sorry, no, they're not pollinators. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Um, so is that the sort of the main reason why people started to be interested in this plant is because of the habitat benefits or was there another reason? I think the value that it has to birds, uh, like I mentioned, migratory endangered birds like whooping mm -hmm. cranes and then our, our local birds like um, pelicans and terns and you see quite a lot of bird diversity at these sites mm. where Lyceum is. Um, and in different areas outside of Louisiana, like Texas and Mississippi, people will see Lyceum and if they work with birds, they know, oh, that's whooping crane habitat. Mm. So I think that was the biggest driver, knowing that the species provided food and habitat. Um, and now that we're trying to explore the best plants for vegetative restoration, this is coming up. I, I'm also hearing from horticulturalists and landscapers, they want to use more native plants. And the species, they have pretty flowers, oh. they have pretty berries, <laughs> the berries are edible, so okay. it's a, a good option, but not a lot of people are growing it yet. Mm. Um, and this is, uh, because this is a much, <laughs> it's a much warmer climate than where I am from, uh, are these, uh, they're sort of shrubby, I guess? Or are they? It depends. Okay. Um, it depends. They can be in salty, saltier habitat, mm -hmm. and they can do well in, in freshwater habitats. Mm -hmm. So if you're somewhere like Queen Bess Island, which is a, a barrier island, they're you know really short, really shrubby, um, mostly due to the salt spray mm -hmm. and you know all the pelicans tramping them down constantly. <laughs> but if you go to more freshwater sites, they can get pretty tall. Like, oh. I'm, I'm five feet. Some of them are taller than me. Okay. Um, so. So there's small to medium species. trees. Small to medium, yeah. shrub, tree, depending on where you want to draw that line. Okay. And are there, uh, is the vegetation sort of evergreen-ish or, or do, are they still dropping leaves in the seasons? They're kind of a different in their fruiting or their flowering season than, than most plants. Okay. Um, we call it Christmas bear because they'll flower in the late fall, like October to December, and then they um, will produce fruit throughout the winter. Oh, so, so that's why they're so important for the winter forage for right. the birds. So okay. when everything else is, you know, shedding their leaves, not producing anything, you have your lyceum that is there and producing fruit. Well, yeah, that that illustrates even better how important they are. That's really interesting. And okay. Sometimes they'll drop their leaves in the summer, but um, you can usually still see them leafy and fleshy, probably because of where we are. Yeah. Um, and occasionally you'll still see a stray flower in the middle of summer. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Um, and you mentioned also the, uh, the habitat loss and habitat shift here along the Gulf and along the river. Um, so do they also have some important function in terms of holding soil in place or sort of, you know, maintaining the structure of the landscape? Right. I think that they could help with vertical accretion to like build the soil level up mm -hmm. because of how they're able to form these networks kind of above ground root systems. Okay. 
Um, so it really just looks like a, a mesh network of different stems. So that will help trap soil and debris yeah. um, and kind of help with storm surge um, abatement. <laughs> That's super important down here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're also, like I mentioned, they're, they're saline tolerant. Mm. So it's a good option to explore for potential agricultural development. I've read some research where they've actually grafted lyceum to tomato plants because they're in the same family, oh, even though they look a little different. Oh, interesting. And that graft has increased the saline tolerance of tomatoes. So Whoa. It's something to consider because a cool. lot of our farmers here are having to, um, to shift what they're working on. Um, their oranges can't work anymore mm -hmm. and things like that. So we're just trying to make it work. <laughs> That's really cool. So this, is, this plant has a lot of different uh, avenues for research, I guess. Huh. Um, so it sounds like what you do involves some field work. So can you tell us a little bit more about like what your field work is like, what you like about your field work, maybe things that are frustrating about your field work? Um, this field work is more manageable than some other uh, <laughs> projects I've been on, to be quite honest. I spend a lot more time in the greenhouse and out at the farm than I do in the field. Mm. But when I am out, out in the field, um, I'm either working with state agencies to try to access protected sites like Clean Best. Um, I'm working with private landowners. If I get a local tip that they have some, mm. then I'm trying to get enough diversity in my sampling. Um, so the best parts, um, sometimes you meet a really nice landowner and they just give you their four-wheeler say, hey, you can go check out the property. It's, it's right over there, the plant. And I'm over here thinking, people are so trusting. Yeah, <laughs> <to get through. laughs> like that's awesome. <laughs> to go um, look through your property. Um, and, you know, I always love being out on the water. I love working with the plants. I love seeing the birds. So what are, uh, what is or are your favorite thing or things about um, being in the sort of like research academia arena of science? <laughs> Ooh, that's a tough one because yeah. um, there are a lot of frustrating things about being in Well, academia. you can start with those, too. <laughs> uh, well, you, some of the culture you kind of have to fight um, with or against, depending on how you look at it, because academia has historically favored and supported a, a very niche t sort of narrative. Um, so especially in my field where we're advocating for more sustainable practices mm. in everything because it affects our natural resources and affects community health. Um, and you know, trying to raise the voices or, and lift up the people who are most deeply, most um, primarily affected by habitat um, degradation and land loss. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're fighting against some giants like the industries are people who don't see the value in our wetlands or our coast or our wildlife. Yeah. Um, so that's really frustrating. But good things, you are surrounded by people who are very intellectually curious, who are often very hardworking. Mm -hmm. um, if you're lucky, you're with people who are, are like-minded and supportive of you and your work, and you can be supportive of their work. Um, and you are exposed to this massive network of people. So even if you're in a location or an institution that isn't the perfect fit for you, usually you can find like, well, maybe this is where I need to be next, or I should talk to this person. Yeah. Um, so it, it opens a lot of doors. And so a lot of people that I work with outside of academia, they're a little uh, skeptical about, you know, oh, it's just a paper. <laughs> You know, just university, um, but it does open a lot of doors to wherever you need to go next um, and to change some of the issues that we have with academia. Yeah, so, so you're talking about a network or a community, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like you were sort of hinting at this idea of like environmental justice or the disparity between the people who might be contributing to environmental issues and those that actually wind up experiencing or having to deal with or having to clean up uh, those environmental issues. So can you talk a little bit more about your experience with those things down here? Yeah, I can. Um, so, as I'm sure you know, 
New Orleans and most of the Gulf Coast um, is heavily impacted by oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. On one hand, it provides a lot of jobs for people. On the other hand, um, it has literally carved out our coast um, and has exposed people to, you know, toxic gases and toxic chemicals and, and exposed our wildlife to that. So you're having to you know, find that political balance between, well, our people do need jobs, but what what use is that job if people are, cannot live, yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, there are a lot of people on the ground outside of academia um, who are advocating for pretty much their right to live and their right to say, we have sovereignty over these lands, mm -hmm. um, especially the tribal communities that are southernmost in Louisiana, um, like the Ile de Jean Charles tribe, Point of Shen, the United Homeland Nation. Like these are people who are the most impacted by um, by coastal land loss because one, they were already forced south from yeah. their homelands during the Indian Removal Act, and then that land is being washed away from them. Um, and we also see this is not just local to Louisiana, but throughout the country, a lot of toxic waste sites and um, pipeline development sites, they are largely in communities of color um, and less affluent communities. Mm -hmm. So those are people who, if there were a disaster or the need to evacuate, they already don't have uh, the resources or the financial flexibility to recover from that. Um, and it's, you know, it's literally environmental racism is what we call it. Yeah. When you are um, hitting harder non-white communities. Um, so fortunately where I'm at, at Nichols, we do have some partnerships with local agencies that are, you know, working with communities instead of that top down, like here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can't do this unless it's, or you can't do this right unless environmental justice initiatives are bottom up, like hearing from the people yeah. who live here and have lived here and like they are the ecological experts because they have lived here for centuries. Um, so it's it's a fight, but you know, <laughs> you keep fighting and um, like we talked about the importance of community. Communities here are really strong, families are really strong, chosen family and your blood family. So mm. um, yeah, I could rattle off all the list of people that I look up to in the environmental justice realm here. Um, so they keep me motivated That's seeing amazing. that people keep working. Yeah. So it sounds like, have you maybe spent quite a bit of time interacting with those stakeholders and you know, like talking to them about what they need in this system? Uh, yeah, as much as I can, yeah. you know, and it, it feels weird to even say stakeholders because the way the culture is in South Louisiana, like <laughs> you live with these people. Sure. So um, these are your neighbors, this is your classmate, your friend that you go play kickball with. Um, so <laughs> these things come up um, casually, you know, sure. on, a, on a weekend, some people might go to the movies or, or something and my friends are like, hey, there's a Bayou Rising uh, community justice and healing retreat, like, come. And I'm mm. like, yes, I'm there. And then you know, that's where you build friendships and partnerships, but you're also planning for, okay, how do we lobby at this next event or what community needs aren't being met? Um, so just from a, a social and a personal side, I try to be involved with what's going on and, and what other people are doing. And then academically at Nichols, our program, they do really try to emphasize getting us out of the lab or the classroom and meeting people in the areas that we're working with Great. and learning from them directly. Nice. So there's a good mix. Yeah, that, that's, I like that they place value on that. That's important. And it's it's also nice how you were um, sort of getting at that, like, yeah, people live 
within the environment, we aren't separate. So it's just always something that is sort of part of what we do. Right. Yeah. Um, so like I said, one of the other things that we try to get at with these interviews is talking about um, diversity in science and how anybody can and should pursue science if um, that's what they're interested in. So can you talk a little bit about um, how any uh, diversity checkboxes that you might <laughs> fill have um, uh, affected your experience in science so far, whether it was in you know grade school or undergrad or in your grad school experience so far? Oh yeah, I, the check boxes, that makes me laugh because I'm, uh, I'm from the Cane River Creole community, which oh. is a mixed Afro-Indigenous um, and European community, but we call ourselves like people, the free people of color because our community was founded by an enslaved woman who was eventually freed and then she bought all of her family as, as much as she could and created this kind of safe space for wow. um, you know freed Africans and people of mixed African and Choctaw descent and other settlers like from China who you know just had this space that was a little bit set aside from the European colonies yeah um, so whenever I would have to check off boxes in grade school, I'd be like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm black and African-American. Yes, I'm Native American. Yes, I'm white. Yes, I'm Chinese. Uh. Like, do you, like, I, do you want me to write down all my ancestors and like my family tree? Cause I can like, um, so I always check off every box, um, Hispanic, uh, queer, everything. Um, but where that comes into play is. Like I mentioned before, academia has historically been like very white, very male-centric, um, very colonial. Like there's a very narrow frame of mind, especially when it comes to science, about what is qualified as science mm. and how we um, describe our relationship with our environment. And so you're you're kind of seeing shifts away from that as more non-white males have access to academia yeah. and are able to <laughs> do their research and, and speak their truths that they have held for you know generations. Um, and we're more and more starting to value that traditional ecological knowledge and um, indigenous-driven science. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm coming into academia at an interesting time because there are still those barriers, yeah. um, things that you know, just seem common sense to me, like, yeah, clearly we can't destroy the environment or else we are destroying ourselves, but, okay, let me go run the stats on it real quick so you believe me. <laughs> like, so, yeah. but I am seeing, like I said, more and more research and um, communities and conferences coming out that center um, indigenous and Hispanic and black scientists, and that's great. Um, and as far as like other diversity things, I identify as queer and pansexual um, and two-spirit. And so, you know, in my freshman biology classes, I have to teach the differences between sex and gender in a mm. way that is, you know, biologically factual. Um, also respectful of, I guess, the conservative region that we live in, but is true to who I am and what I know. And right the growing body of sciences that we have about, you know, sex and gender are different and we should respect them. You know, that always comes up in biology and even something as little as, you know, calling a, a male fish, oh, this is the boy, and oh. a female fish, well, this is the girl. You know, you kind of want to break down, well, maybe we should keep things biological and um, not conflate things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> It's something that I bring up with, you know, my professors and advisors too. Whenever we're reviewing papers, um, so it's just you, you're usually if you are, I don't like saying a minority, but if you are one of few <laughs> of your people <laughs> in yeah. a group, um, you're always that that sole voice saying like, well, no one else is going to say it, and I can't sit back and and let people just speak nonsense or, or say something that. Um, is culturally insensitive or kind of disrespectful to non-binary folks or, or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I'm usually that person speaking up and 
Yeah. Is that, because um, I've heard a lot of things about this from different people, um, whether it's being a woman or, or being someone of color or being on LGBTQ, um, is that a responsibility that you place on yourself and you like, yes, I'm, I'm the one who's going to do the thing, or do you feel like it's external and people are like, oh, well, you're the one who should be, you know, reminding us about this because you're the diverse person in the group, like... It depends on the day. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I really want to have the energy and the drive and be that warrior and be like, I am here to speak for myself and like I will not be disrespected and I will not let people uh, talk down to me and like I will fight anyone who's trying to um, <laughs> like push me out of this space and assert their privilege. And other days I'm like, I really just want to do science and I don't want to fight people. Yeah. But you know, if if this is a space where the culture and the people are toxic to people who aren't part of that majority, you have to find that balance between, okay, do I have the energy to address this right now? Is this person gonna be receptive at all? Um, do I have any allies in the room who can you know, corroborate what I'm saying and you know, back me up a little bit? Or would it be better just to say like, all right, bye y'all, I'm leaving now and I'll come back later. <laughs> um, so fortunately, I do have a lot of allies where I'm at um, and our school is increasingly trying to prioritize diversity and inclusion to make our campus um, a safer, more supportive space for a more diverse student body and faculty. Thank goodness. So, yeah, and, I, and because there's that support, I'm able to you know, speak up when I feel the need to. Mm. Nice. Um, and what sort of things, you said you do some uh, outreach with schools and things, so you might already do this sometimes, but what sorts of things would you want to say to someone um, coming to a science or academic uh, job or career path um, who might share some or all of your background experiences? What would you want them to know going in or, or sort of like tell them that they should expect or be ready for that kind of stuff? Um, don't let people beat you down because you will probably get some flack for being the newbie or the young intern or if you're a woman in a male dominated field mm -hmm. you might deal with some of that you might deal with um, some other forms of bigotry don't let people grind you down um, if you are passionate about science and you have goals and you have dreams don't let anyone take that from you or make you feel like you don't belong in the sciences because you do like we probably need you <laughs> um, so you know keep motivated stay strong and stay focused on why you're there and know that you are worthy and you're capable and you're talented um, and rely on communities that you can find even if you're at an institution that like you don't feel supported by or there aren't a lot of people like you locally there are whole communities online um, science twitter facebook groups um, you know whole newsletters and online lectures that are all about like being black in grad school and queer stem mm -hmm. and like natives in science there are all of these affinity science groups that want more people to explore science whether professionally or, or just for fun and you know are happy to provide any assistance or resources to keep you there yeah um, so yeah and like you said um, about not letting people grind you down uh, that includes as you were telling me off camera um, sometimes making hard decisions to remove yourself from situations that aren't good for you right right and this goes you know from science to outside of science a lot of people just entering the workforce um, they feel like they have to take abuse or they have to take no pay or inconsequ inconsequential pay because that's just what you do and you have to prove that you can take that abuse to earn your next spot. <laughs> no. Like, no one should have to work in a toxic or abusive environment. Um, if you are being mistreated, that's not on you. That person has some issues that they are projecting on you. Find someone that you can talk to and confide in. Say, this is what you're experiencing. What do I do? Are there alternatives? Usually there are. Um, maybe you can work on a different project or find a connection at a different job or something. No one should have to work 
um, in a space where they feel disrespected and unwanted. Yeah. <laughs> Very powerful stuff. Um, so we always like to ask this sort of like, it's a little cliche of a question, but what is next for you? Where do you see yourself going post <laughs> where we are right now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I have so many options. <laughs> uh, well, I'm definitely going to take some time <clears throat> off to um, care for my grandparents because mm. they are in their late 80s and 90s. Like, yay, good genes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to help my family um, care for them for some time. Um, and like I was saying off camera, I'm kind of thinking about shifting gears from straight science and exploring law and policy. Because um, I know we need more lawyers with science backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And the more that I involve myself in science, the more I see that a lot of the barricades against like what we can really accomplish for our environment and for our people are legal blockades. Yeah. Right. So uh, the more that I uh, like get in depth into my science career, the more I'm seeing a lot of the barriers to what people can effectively do in their research or for the communities that they're working in or the ecosystems they're working with there are a lot of legal barricades to actually applying the science that we're interested in for the benefit of wildlife and people. Yeah. So part of me, as much as I love science, I'm like, well, you know, if I'm, if I have the skills to be a good lawyer, I could still be a science lawyer, yeah. um, you know, and go into <coughs> environmental law. So I'm thinking about programs like that hmm. um, where I can kind of blend my passions for science and community justice and public speaking. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's good to remember and be mindful that like those things don't have to be mutually exclusive and that taking an um, interdisciplinary approach winds up, yeah, that's like the next step we're reaching into like where we need to be in terms of bringing all of these things together. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> that's so awesome. I'll go where the tides take me, but <laughs> I, I I hope they take me somewhere good where I can do good work and um, do work that makes me happy as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I hope so too, because it sounds like you've got a lot of energy and passion for doing good things that are valuable to people. So I'd like to thank Kellen so much for speaking with us today and for being patient with my technology. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.